My name is Tasha Kapp and I'm actually the Assistant Director of Graduate and Off-Campus Housing here. Finding an apartment can be overwhelming. Understanding the market, understanding the cost, cost for value, it can be a lot. So number one is determining your budget. On average, your rent should be 25 to 35% of your income, but if you're any familiar at all with Boston, Cambridge, it may be a little bit more than that. Um, so one thing I tell people who are coming into my office is determine all of your expenses. And one expense a lot of people don't necessarily um, add in are optional expenses. This is a very, very social city. Going out, a few drinks here and there definitely add up. Um, so having your fixed expenses, things you have to pay for, your cell phone, your utility, whatever the case may be, optional expenses, um, and deduct that from your income gives you kind of the framework of what you should be looking at. Again, it should be 25 to 35%, but Boston is number three in the country in terms of most expensive city. So those numbers are a bit skewed when this, within this particular location. To create a wish list, um, when you're looking at renting, there's some non-negotiables. Uh, for example, my sister just moved here a year ago. Non-negotiable was parking on site. Non-negotiable was uh, having a washer dryer within her um, apartment. So what are some of your wish lists? What are some of the things that you really, really want? Again, it sounds simple, but within this particular market, highly unlikely that you'll get everything that you want unless you have a really, really good budget. So you're gonna have to be willing to negotiate and to kind of navigate between your non-negotiables and some things that you're willing to compromise on. So the easiest way to start off is kind of make that list. Are you okay with going to a laundry mat? You know, are you okay with having a coin laundry in the basement? Do you have to have parking? How close do you have to be to public transportation? How far do you have to be from a grocery store? These little things matter, um, and those are some things that you should definitely consider. Um, also, how many bedrooms and bathrooms? That's going to greatly fluctuate your budget. So let's say um, you're looking at $1,000. So if four, four people are sharing an apartment, the average is about 850 to 875 per person. Three people is closer to 925, 950. Two people could be up to 11, 1200. So the thing about the market is those are average rents, but there are definitely properties that are anomalies that you can find that are great value. So who is willing to live with each other? Who's not? So one of the greatest things I see is when you have a group of people, four people, at max, we would love to live together, but we're okay separating off two to two depending on what we find. So that opens up your opportunity. Now this is a big, big factor. Again, I've lived all over, and one thing I can say is before I moved, I spent so many hours researching the locations. That includes crime rates. Um, how are the local schools ranked in the area? No, I don't have children, but it's kind of indicative of some things. Not always, but sometimes. Um, the amenities that are around. Take your time to research. Now, specifically within Boston, everything's grouped into squares, as you know. Kendall Square, Harvard Square, Inman Square. There's all these little squares that have their own personalities, that have their own feel. So take the next, especially if you're looking for the summer, take the next month or two just going around the city because there's probably some areas you've never explored that would be fantastic for you, easy access to the campus, and give you more likely the things that you want than staying right here in the hub of Cambridge. Another thing I use all the time, Google Maps, Google Earth. So you're looking for a place, hey, I want to see what the street looks like. Now research your rent trends. This is going to be key. Um, so I gave you some of the rent averages in the area. A studio in Cambridge is approximately 18 to 1900. A one bedroom is approximately 2100. Two bedrooms are closer to 23. Three bedrooms on up. So those are just, again, averages. But it can fluctuate one way or another. Um, especially if you have a good private landlord, they just want a good tenant. So typically their rents aren't as high. And a lot of times that goes through word of mouth. Um, but take your time to research your rent. So a lot of the issues I've seen with students coming into my office is they reach out to someone, here's a great deal on a property, um, and they end up getting scammed because they didn't understand the rents for the area. 
So you have, and again, it's not that it can't happen. I have someone who's living in a massive studio in Back Bay for 1500. That's an anomaly. Uh, studios in Back Bay are closer to 2000 plus. But if you're coming to me and say, hey, here is this totally completely updated hardwood floors, granite, $1,300 in Back Bay, I'm thinking, mm, that does not even sound right. You know, so take the time to research what is about average in the area, and that will kind of prevent you from scams and understanding if you're getting a good value or a really good deal in the area. So one way or MLS, so multiple listing service, it's what a lot of the realtors um, use to market properties. So of course that's also used in Zillow and Trulia. One thing you have to be aware of with Trulia and Zillow um, are bait and switch. So a lot of times landlords, not landlords, but more so realtors, they'll put out properties that look like a good deal, but they're not available. Just to get you in and say, oh, but I have another property. You know, it'll work for you. So just be aware of bait and switch. So one thing I do when I work with people say, hey, what do you think about this property, Tasha? I Google it. Where is it advertised? Who's advertising it? Is the price consistent? It will tell you a lot. Even if it's not the specific property, if it's an apartment building, you'll have an idea of the cost within the building. So just do your due diligence about the different rental trends. Local property management, honestly, that's where you may get some of your best deals. There's a lot of really good local property management companies that manage buildings that are approximately 20 to 30 units per building. Um, small buildings, not highly advertised, but they'll manage three or four. And those properties typically are really good value most times. So just take your time, do a search for local property management companies, see what they have available. Sometimes they don't advertise it, but just set up an appointment with them to see what they have in their portfolio. Um, and that could be a really, really good option for you. Local newspaper um, is a good one. So there are also some Facebook groups um, that I myself have joined just so that I'm in the know for Harvard and MIT and just the local area and people are advertising their properties. So that's a really good option. So five, prepare your financial information. If you're looking in Boston, they are going to want to run a background and credit check, period. They wanna know where your finances stand. So already be aware of what your credit report says, especially if you're a domestic student. Bring a recent tax return, bank statements. So if you're international, you don't necessarily have credit, how much money do you have in your savings account? These are things they're going to want to know. They want to know what is your proof of income? How are you going to get money? So those are the things you're going to have to think about. Sometimes they'll request a guarantor, which is a person who is signing the lease on your behalf. If you're not able to make your rent payments, they'll take responsibility. Um, that has to be a U.S. citizen. So something to think about. Unfortunately, MIT does not act as a guarantor, but sometimes they'll say, we're just not quite sure. You're going to need a guarantor. Um, so that's definitely something to think about. Your letter of appointment acceptance, any of your pay stubs and letter of references. If you have any pets, um, it's hard to find properties with pets in Boston. Um, one thing I tell people all the time is get a letter of reference for your animals. So specifically within Boston, some fee, uh, fees to be aware of. So what you can be charged moving into your first month, your last month, your security deposit, a broker fee and a lock fee. So essentially you can be charged four times your rent to get into an apartment here. It's expensive. <laughs> the broker's fee, you will not get back. It's just a, it's a quote unquote finder's fee. So when you're thinking about your budget and moving somewhere, think about the total cost. I tell people be prepared for four times rent. You may not have to pay it, it may just be first and last, first and security, but just be prepared that if you find your dream place that this is what it could cost um, getting into it. Some illegal fees, but this happens all the time in Boston, um, holding deposits. The market here moves so, so quickly. And this is what I tell people. Holding deposits are illegal. If you are in a position where you're being requested to hold, um, an apartment, one, be comfortable with it, two, make sure you clarify what that money is going to be allocated to. Are they just holding a check and they're gonna rip it up once everything is then turned in with the application or accepted? Is it going to be cash and applied to first month's rent? So make sure you're very clear 
whenever you're giving money over, how it's going to be applied. A little bit more information about broker's fees. So you are allowed to work with multiple realtors in the area. Um, but how it works is if one realtor one shows you an apartment, you go to realtor two, realtor two then shows you the same apartment, you decide to take it, realtor one is still do that fee. So be very mindful of that. So a lot of realtors have contracts that you sign. Be really, really aware of what that contract says. One um, loophole that I see all the time that people get stuck in, a lot of students, especially, specifically at MIT, want to sell during the summer. They want to be able to do their internships, get out their um, leases. So you will sign a clause with a realtor, and within the clause it may say that once the application is accepted, <laughs> the realtor's fee is paid. But what you're not aware of is if you're able to sublicense or sublet because you don't have the lease yet. So be aware of that. So what I tell people all the time is ask for a copy of the lease before you submit your application. So if you know there's some terms and conditions that you absolutely need to have in order to take the apartment, be aware of your process because if you apply and the landlord accepts it, but then you don't agree to the terms, you've just lost a broker's fee. So just be aware of those steps in the process. And um, a little bullet down there, a lot of people don't realize this. If they are a realtor and they're managing the property, they cannot charge you a realtor's fee. And a lot of them do. So if they're the property manager, if they're the person that you would go to, you have any questions, they cannot charge you a realtor fee it's considered double dipping and it's against their licensing. And a lot of people do it. So just something just to be aware of as you're going through the process. So scheduling your appointments. Again, Boston moves quickly, especially if you all are looking at moving during the summer. 70% of leases are signed for September 1. So it moves very, very quickly. My recommendation is a few days prior to when you want to search, contact realtors, contact landlords, set up many appointments as you can. I suggest four. Four is more than enough. At that point, they start blurring together. Four appointments a day would be definitely my recommendation. Bring your wish list. The things that you really, really want, things you're willing to compromise on. Bring somebody with you who's not going to be renting. Typically, they're pretty objective and will give you perspective that you yourself can't see. Community safety is big. Everything looks amazing in the daytime. Everything. Go back at night. Now, even if it's in a great area, if it's not well lit, would you feel comfortable going home at night? It could be a fantastic area, but there's some places that are just not well lit at all. And so what would that path home at night feel like for you? Then I would also say, if possible, because the market does move very quickly, try to get a second walkthrough. The first time you're looking for everything that is right, sometimes you don't see everything that's wrong. Walkthroughs, as you're going through the property, Definitely, definitely do your positives and negatives. Everything's gonna look great, especially if it's completely repainted and it's gonna look pretty, but you have to be really honest. For me, when I was moving, I'm coming from the South, we have walk-in closets as big as some people's bedrooms. I need closet space, you know? So that was number one non-negotiable for me. I, I, can't, I can't work with that, you know? So being aware of what your needs are and looking at the apartment critically, Appliances, how old are they? And again, not that old is bad, but are they being well maintained? Bathroom condition, is there any evidence of mold, wet, or damp? You know, so definitely have a look around. Something else to think about is the cost of heat here. And so it could be oil, it could be electric, it could be gas. If it's a newer building, if it's an older building, the prices can fluctuate from $150. I had a friend that had to pay $400. Big gap. So call Eversource. Eversource is really great. Saying, I'm looking at moving into this property. This is the address. What are the average costs for heat during the winter? Now, if a property says heat and hot water is included, that's great because you have controlled your cost. But what does it mean by heat's included? So, for example, I have a friend, her landlord keeps the heat at 63 degrees. I can't function that way. For her, it's fine, but what does that mean? So speaking to the landlord, 
When heat's included, what does that actually mean? Are you controlling the temperature and it's a set temperature for the winter? Or is it that I'm able to control and gauge it myself? So that's another question to ask if heat is included. A couple of the things to think about are the electrical outlets. Sometimes older buildings don't have a lot of electrical outlets. Um, so many people don't think about that. Um, now that we're in kind of a technological era, we plug in a lot of things. Also smoke detectors, um, window and door locks. Like I said, the young lady who was not able to lock her front door and also evidence of pest. So open those cabinets under the sink to see if there's any droppings. You know, those are things that you're gonna need to know. So signing the lease, um, filling out an application. I've had a lot of questions about this. The application is going to ask for your social security number. It's gonna ask for your bank account information. It's going to ask for all of this background information. So what I say, unless you absolutely know that you want this property, this is very personal information. You don't just want to hand it over. So that's when I say when you walk into a property, you want to be very prepared um, with your information, what you want, what you don't want, because one of the last stages is turning over your personal information. So if you've never met a broker and everything's through email, and he's saying, hey, send me, I don't know about that. You know, they can definitely steal your, there's a lot of scams, a lot of scams. Um, so you definitely want to be aware of that. Don't feel pressured. So the broker is not your friend. The broker is their own friend. Their job is to get the property leased so they get paid. There are some amazing brokers and realtors out there, and there are some that are highly unethical in the local area. There's 60 schools in our radius, 60 schools. It's the youngest city in the country. So they will definitely exploit as much as they can. So they'll pressure you. So, but feel free to take a step back and say, you know what, I just need to really think about it and get back to you first thing in the morning. If you lose the property, then you have to ask yourself, well, was it really meant to be mine or not? Um, you don't want to make a hasty decision and be locked into a lease that you cannot get out of. Read and review your lease thoroughly. One thing that I do in my office is I review leases. So if you have a lease um, that you want reviewed before you sign it, feel free to email it over. I typically need about 24 hours, um, but then I'll email you back with any questions or concerns. And any agreements you have, have it in writing. And understand, again, the realtor's broker's job is to get the property rented. So they'll, sometimes they'll tell you anything. Make sure it's in writing in the lease. Some clauses in the lease to be aware of. Um, the tenant is responsible for making all repairs. So there's a difference between damage and wear and tear. For example, the sink disposal, and it stops working. It's been there for, it's wear and tear. You put a fork down the sink and you didn't realize it, you turned it on and it breaks, that's damage. So if anywhere in the lease it says that you're responsible for all repairs, that's not the case. One thing I tell people is when you're realizing these um, clauses within your lease, not all of the clauses have to be changed simply because you're covered by Massachusetts statute. It just means that you need to be aware of. So for example, if you see this clause, by Massachusetts statute, they cannot make you do so. Do you have to change it on a lease? Not necessarily. But you should just be aware that it's one of those things that they cannot necessarily make you do. They have to demonstrate that it's actually damaged. Um, the landlord is able to use your security deposit for bills. A security deposit specifically are for damages, and this is where they'll get you. Another thing, when you're moving in and you're handing over to the realtor your security deposit, one thing that should happen is they should give you a receipt right then and there. The next thing, 30 days later, there should be a receipt showing that your security deposit has been deposited in a separate bank account accruing interest. So you should receive two receipts for your security deposit. A lot of times landlords will just hold on to the money in their personal bank account. By law, they cannot do so. And you could be awarded triple damages. That you have to pay for utilities in the name of your landlord. All utilities that you pay for should be in your name. Late fees, in the state of Massachusetts, late is 30 days. And then also you must pay the remainder of your rent if you terminate early. This is what I tell them, you are still responsible for your rent till the end of the contract. 
but you're not required to pay everything upfront. And also, it's the um, legal obligation of the landlord to mitigate your costs. So if you decide you have to terminate for January and your lease is till June, they still are required to actively try to find a tenant to mitigate your costs, but you're still responsible till a tenant is actually found. So this is the key thing, again, that will help people when you're moving in. So let's say you decided this is a great place, I'm going to move in. You need to do a thorough walkthrough. So in the state of Massachusetts, you should have a statement of condition report. Sometimes landlords give it to you, sometimes they don't. If they don't give you a statement of condition report, I would still recommend that you do a complete walkthrough. And doing a complete walkthrough, you are noting every <laughs> single damage there is because it helps you on the back end. Now, this is a tenant state, so in the court of law, landlords have to prove rather than tenants have to prove. So landlords will have to prove that there was damage rather than tenants have to prove I didn't do it. So it's kind of to your advantage, but this will help you on the long run. So you first move into an apartment, hopefully you get a statement of condition which will already outline what some of the issues are within the apartment. If not, do a full walkthrough. Do a full walkthrough to see what's going on with the apartment. Under, in the state of Massachusetts, there's also a health and safety code checklist which will tell you how hot the water should be electric outlets there should be. So you can actually pull off um, the internet, the health and safety code checklist, which will give you more details to see how much in code your apartment is. Are there no screens on the windows? That's against health and safety regulations. By law, they have to put on screens. So these are little nuances that will help you out in the long run as you're doing your walkthrough. So I would definitely say download the health and safety code checklist. It will help you out definitely understanding what is and what is not in code. Boston has an app and you can actually just go on 311 and um, text them code violations and they'll send somebody out. If there's major breaches, you can actually call for um, the city to come in to do a full review. So leaky pipes, all major breaches, they will actually have an investigator come out. So take photos, itemize any damages and send the documentation. So if you have the statement of condition, great. If not, Still itemize it, still email it off when you first move in. And lastly, please purchase renter's insurance. A landlord's insurance, homeowner's insurance, only covers the structure of the property. If the building burns down, you are out of luck. It, depending on the value of your items, it could be from $10 to $25 a month. Probably closer to 10 to 15. But it's worth um, actually getting renter's insurance. If you've watched the news, in Boston, there's lots of fires, and there's lots of pipes bursting. It happens all the time. It's an older city, pipes burst all the time. So how are, how's your property gonna be covered? You know, so when the fire happened in Cambridge, I have all of these people in my office, I'm trying to help them find housing, and my first question is, do you have renter's insurance? Some do, some don't. Think about your laptops, think about your clothes, think about your cameras, think about your phones, how are those gonna be replaced? So is it worth the extra $10 a month just to make sure that you're covered? Where can I get renter's insurance? So you can go through Liberty Insurance. There's quite a few online. Um, if you have a car, sometimes a car insurance will actually bundle it together. Um, so there's quite a few different options. Do banks provide renter's insurance coverage? No. It's usually um, an agency that actually does insurance, actually provides it. If I'm not happy with my rental, can I give notice and move even though I have a lease? Depending on the terms of the contract, it may say something in there that a landlord will give 60 days notice, but for the most part, it's very difficult to get out of leases in this area. How do I know if I'm being scammed? So most times, I'm gonna be honest, are people who are away and they don't have time to search. Um, they see a property, it seems like it's a very good um, price. Number one, I say, anyone who says they're a realtor, you can check their license on the Massachusetts um, licensing board. So that's first thing first, protect yourself in that way. If they're a realtor, check their license. Make sure you see the property. And even sometimes when you see the property, it still can be a scam. So that's when cross-referencing really helps. So if you have a really nice place in Back Bay, 
and they're saying, hey, it's $1,200, but I can't show you today, we'll come tomorrow, I want you to send a deposit, we'll show everything. I say make sure you follow your gut instinct. If something does not feel right, just stop. How much is the typical broker's fee? Broker's fee equals to one month's rent. So if an apartment's 4,500, sharing between four people, your broker's fee is $4,500. Do I have to use a broker? You do not, but about 70% of the market does go through brokers. How do I know if the rent is fair, market value? Comparing market rents in general in that particular area to see what the rents are going for. So like I said, for Cambridge, if you're sharing um, four people, it'll be about 850. Three people, it'll be about 925-ish. Two people, it'll go from like 1100 1200 depending, up to 1500 It's not uncommon to see 1500 depending on where you live. So those are the averages in Cambridge. 